Um, so usually when, when people think about retail, they think about hourly customer service associates and high volume hiring and point of sale systems from 1996. And this group is here to talk a little bit about what the future of retail holds and what they've learned in their time at their, their organizations and some of the things that they're doing that's really cool that you may not have heard about before. So super excited to have them up here. Instead of me introducing them, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So name, company, and how you'd actually describe your org if you were at a dinner party. So like the snippet of who your, who your org is. I'm up, I'm up first. You're up first because you're closest. Right, okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Jared Best. I've uh, been with Abercrombie for uh, a little over three years. And um, I'm the Smart Recruiters product owner. And I lead our global TA for information technology, e-commerce operations, and our uh, IT college recruiting program. Um, Abercrombie is a, a global specialty retailer of apparel and accessories for men, women, and kids uh, across our three renowned brands, um, Hollister, Gilly Hicks, um, Abercrombie & Fitch, and a and Kids. Awesome. Kate, you're up. Kate Beckett, um, VP of Total Rewards and HR Technology at Indigo Books and Music. Do we have any Canadians in the room? Yay! Uh, There's a few! There we go. Um, so Indigo is uh, best known for being a book retailer, but also um, highly curated uh, gifting, toys, um, and also known for their very excellent customer experience. Uh, we recently um, made our first venture into the U.S., so we opened our first store in New Jersey late last year. It's going really, really well. Um, really interesting because when we were going down doing all the recon before we went there, for Canadians, um, you know what that brand looks and feels like, and when you go to the U.S. and you're trying to explain that brand to uh, many of you in this room who wouldn't know what it is, um, it's really interesting because you don't want to say Barnes & Nobles and you don't want to say, you know, it's like this. You kind of really want to say what we are. So I... One of our first customers in New Jersey had said, it's like if Barnes and Nobles and Anthropology had a baby. <laughs> and I was like, I like that. I'm going to keep that. So that's who we are. I love it. I have a similar uh, circumstance. So I, I actually live in New Zealand. I work for a New Zealand-based retailer. Uh, it's actually the largest in the, company, uh, largest in the country. And we operate four formats that, if I describe what they are up here, being in, in, in the U.S., you'd be like, well, which companies are those? Uh, so we have a general merchandise, and we have some sports specialty, as well as appliance and electronics. Um, so what I, how I would describe it here at a dinner party would be, you probably already shop at similar brands here in the U.S., whether that be Walmart, Staples, REI, or Best Buy. We have the equivalent in New Zealand, um, and we're the largest retailer, as well as one of the largest employers in the country. Um, and currently, I am the head of HR for the group. Thank you. So these guys kind of know what they're talking about and work for a bunch of very different brands, which is super exciting. So hopefully you guys will get some good stuff out of them. So first question, and this one I'm going to have each of you answer in, in whichever order you feel most comfortable, but what is the biggest challenge that you in your talent orgs are facing today? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump right in. Um, you know, for me, I, I just moved out to New Zealand uh, within the last seven months, and, and it's really been interesting coming from a global retailer with a presence there to actually kind of being turned upside down and realizing how restrictive sometimes contracts can be and then also being part of a, a labor government right now. Um, contracts are actually pretty restrictive in terms of how talent can move and talent can grow within an organization. So being able to kind of think about where we are today and where we need to be in two to three years and thinking about what we need to be doing differently with our work, workforce, more so on their contracts so that it can get the right experiences, is probably one of the things that we're thinking about forefront right now. So not only on our frontline employees, but also when we think about our office support. You, know, you mentioned this earlier. When you think about retail, the first thing is it's like, oh, you work in a store. And it's like, no, there's a whole set of people on marketing and IT that make all that great stuff happen. It's just those individuals bring it to life in the box. So yeah, for us, I think it's, it's around making sure we have the right talent, give them the right skills, but also being able to do that in somewhat of a restrictive environment. For Indigo, I mean, I think one of the challenges, and maybe for many of you in this room, is really how do you attract and retain in sort of, I'll call it an Amazon world, where everybody that works for any organization, you can go somewhere else and make more money. Like, people know that, and you can find the product cheaper online somewhere, whether it's Amazon or somewhere else. So, I mean, it's really about, and you know, maybe it sounds like HR speak or whatever, but it is around the culture and the brand and being able to really articulate that to customers and to the talent so that they really feel what that's like because anybody can go anywhere, right? So you have to really be able to articulate what 
your brand is and what your culture really means because people want to belong to something and they want to connect with a brand. Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge is, you know, we know we have a great culture and we know we have a, a great brand, but it's continually trying to reinforce that with our prospective talent and with our customers. Yeah, for us, it's location. Um, <laughs> Columbus, Ohio is, believe it or not, the third largest retail hub in the U.S. Um, behind California and New York. Um, but we have a much smaller candidate pool. So uh, we often find ourselves challenged with relocating that talent from those markets, um, you know, really selling candidates on, on why Columbus, Ohio, uh, and then um, making the tough decision to, to grow talent from within if we can't find it. Hmm. I've been to Columbus, Ohio. It's pretty cool. It is. In case you were ever wondering. Pretty amazing city. <laughs> okay, cool. So now we get specific questions for each of you guys that are relevant to sort of what's going on in your business. So, Jared, let's start with you. So, transformation, super hard. Yeah. You guys are going through a massive technology overhaul in your space. So, why don't you tell the group a little bit about the catalyst for the project, how you built the business case, T talk about sort of the beginnings of, of what you're going through. Yeah, so to kind of, for, for context, a and has four recruiting teams across our stores, um, experienced supply chain and uh, college recruiting programs. Um, and as many of you in the room can appreciate, the hiring landscape in retail has changed pretty drastically. And uh, we've had to adapt our technology and our process to meet some of that need. Um, our existing technology worked okay through some of the change. Um, what we found is it uh, really lacked innovation, you know, quickly got out of date. Um, we, you know, were constantly, uh, you know, working with IT to make updates, and it was it was cumbersome, you know, to maintain. Um, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, it 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 really failed to deliver an experience that our our candidates expected and that uh, that matched our brand experience. Um, I think that was the biggest miss. Um, so, you know, we we knew we had to make a change. Um, and when we uh, looked at the landscape. We, we really had to take a step back and think about global technology. What does our process look like? Um, what does global TA mean for us? And um, really assess our process. What we found is that we were often hiring in silos um, across the teams, really lacked visibility and parity. Um, we're often providing a different candidate experience across those uh, platforms and really failed to deliver an experience that our candidates expected. Um, you know, fast, mobile friendly, and non-intrusive. <laughs> um, you know, we found that no one likes setting up an account to apply for a position. Um, so we knew we had to make change, uh, and our existing tech stack was just not going to get us there. Um, so we, we built our business case to focus on like five key areas, uh, providing a best-in-class candidate experience, uh, something that was mobile-friendly, um, something that was easy for the business to adopt, something that would give us a global single source of record across the organization, and um, something that was you know, easily integrated into all of our HR systems, um, hiring platforms, and, and hiring tools. Um, so we did what most organizations do when you want to move really fast. We put out an RFP. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, we, we, we did truly need to assess the market to understand whether or not there was a, a tool out there that can meet the diverse needs of you know, the, the four teams that we have and, and bring everyone together on a single platform um, that made sense for all the, the complexity that we have. And um, you know, we spent the next six to nine months assessing our, our process, assessing current state, um, asking a lot of difficult questions on what the future state looks like, and, and really pushing boundaries beyond you know, not just like catching up, but like you know, building something that was sustainable for the future. And uh, we learned a lot about technology. We learned a lot about um, where we were deficient. Uh, we learned a lot about c capabilities that we didn't care about. You know, and and, um, and that, help, that helped us weed down uh, you know, the, the tools that we were looking at. And we were looking for a tool that we could manage in the business. Um, you know, working with IT is great. It's 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 great partnership. We have um, a, an amazing team. But when we need to move quick, it's like we don't want to go through the the, the laborious process of getting a project approved and, and all the, the steps that we have to do to, to get things done. We want to go into the system. We want to have um, you know an admin in, in HR and make the change. We are also looking for a, a partner through the journey. Um, you know, we with our old old systems and technology. You know, it was a buy the tool and, and kind of you know go after it. And and we really wanted a partner to take the journey with us. And after meeting the smart recruiters team, um, they felt like us. You know, it was uh, we were comfortable. Um, it made sense, and it was a very easy decision when we decided to go with smart recruiters. 
I promise I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting because I, Jared and I have had a lot of conversations about the ANF model, and I think if you want to talk to somebody about complexity and taking something really, really complicated with very different structured hiring processes for very different use cases and finding a way to f to bring similarity and continuity across, he's your guy. So definitely take the time to get to, to spend some time with Jared later. If you, if you have the opportunity, because they've done a ton of work to get this thing to where it is today. Not quite done. Yeah. But yeah, we've taken a, a phased approach. So, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll continue to phase two and phase three. Yeah. And but it's good. It's all good. Cool. So, okay, Kate, Kate, we're going to talk about comp, because you guys are doing something really cool and really different to stay ahead of the competitor you had, you had to, uh, yourself even in your intro talked about in the world of Amazon or the faster, cheaper, better, quicker. You guys are doing something around comp to stay ahead of the market and attract and retain people. What, what does it look like, and how did you build it? Well, we think it's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> I mean, really, you know, what everything comes down to is talent. Um, you, you know, you can... You can do everything outside to try to make sure you have the right um, pieces in place, but if you're not hiring the best talent, that's where it starts. So really, this is, first and foremost, it's a talent strategy, which we sort of leverage some, some comp things around it, and I'll, and I'll walk you through it. I mean, really, if, if I could sum it up, we are hiring better, we're hiring less people, and then we're giving those people more. So at the end of the day, it's less people who are doing more, who are more engaged in making more. Um, so it sounds a little bit complicated, but I mean, people want to have big, meaty roles. We actually, I think we do ourselves a disservice when we say more is more, because it's not. Um, you know, actually, people want big, meaty roles. Um, I can give you a couple examples, I think, that are, are pretty cool of what we've been through. So in some of the stores, um, there might have been like a five or six liter uh, store model. So in this particular store, there might be five or six, like a general manager and some assistant managers and, and some associates. So we took um, the first pass, we took 10 stores and they all volunteered. So nobody was forced to do this. Everybody put up their hands. So if these stores lost a leader by attrition, so they went to another store, or somebody resigned, we asked those remaining store leaders, so the remaining five or six people, what do you want to do here? Do you want to replace that person? If you do, fine, go ahead put out the wreck, or do you want to see if you can do it with the leadership team you have in place? And, oh, by the way, you get a little bit of that money back. So what we did was we split it about 60-40, so the, your organization took sort of like 60% and then the 40%. It, meant, it didn't mean people got huge pay raises, but they got a bit like a meaningful bump, and they worked without that extra leader. So, you know, did people work 80 hours a week? No. They actually, they worked smarter, they gelled more of a team, mm. the communication was more streamlined, they had clearer decision rights, and after a year in that pilot, only one store added back the leader. Wow. And if you ask the other stores, they wouldn't hire back another person for free because they said that they, like, they're more engaged, and it worked at all levels, so it meant that the leadership team was pushing down things to the associate group, you know, doing the scheduling, doing more like the manager type task that was developing that group too. Mm. So it really, it had the impact of having the whole team more engaged. Another quick example is around, you know, performance management. I mean, this really goes back to, it's all about, you know, hiring the best people, paying them more. We used to sort of old model was, you know, lower performers got like a couple percent and then higher performers got like a couple more percent. Um, and we really flipped that model very on purpose. So we would actually take, so last year, we took 10% of our labor dollars out. So for those of you in retail and manufacturing, no, that's a lot of money. money. We took that out. We actually, 20% of the workforce didn't get an increase. And we spread that really on purpose with the 80% left. And so if you were a high performer, you got more shifts and you got more money. So the result now is that we actually, into our last holiday season, we hired 22% less seasonal staff. Amazing. Yes. Huge win. <laughs> um, and we're getting higher caliber talent. And the people who are higher performers are working more. I mean, it's the working the way it's supposed to work. I mean, obviously, there's some challenges and some hard conversations along the way. Um, but I think it, this is really the trajectory that we're on now. I mean, the, the challenge will be, we talk about 
we've done it in the stores, it's much more challenging, I think, to take this sort of broader to the, our warehouses and our, and our home office. So that's sort of the challenge that we're at now. Awesome. But 22% less hires is a whole lot less, oh my God, scramble on right. the day before Black Friday, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last but certainly not least. Um, Talk to us a little bit, Alexis, about how you're using tech to drive better candidate experience. And I understand that that's like a core tenet of the belief of your organization. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, you know, for the warehouse group, um, when you think about retail, the reality is we're not selling merchandise. It's about the talent. The talent's what really brings the merchandise to life in the stores that we operate and the experience that you have as a consumer. Um, and I think when you have a choice about a career, it's like making the same type of choice of what car I'm gonna, gonna drive and where am I gonna live in the house that I'm purchasing. So how we think about a consumer grade experience matters. Um, if I just draw a little bit about my experience at Foot Locker, our use case was a little bit different. We had high volume, we were 11 decentralized companies, we were going towards a transformation where we wanted to be two structures, so efficiencies were required. We wanted to take 43 inputs of hiring a t uh, an, an associate down to three clicks. Um, because we needed that. We wanted to have the financial controls that say, here's your set volume of store and here's how many employees you're able to have at the following set uh, salaries based on potential demand. So there was a specific use case of why we were looking at how we can actually think more globally, because it was a global operation in 30 countries, but act locally in terms of what we were doing in North America and what we were doing in Europe and what some of the restrictions were there as, as well as Asia Pacific. Um, but at the warehouse, it's a little bit different. We're one geography. We have support offices in China, Bangladesh, and India, but majority of our population is in one country. And we have five million people in the entire country. And there's a lot of people from all over the other world that come in for the year of OE experience. So for us, it's more around the talent pool that we have is a talent pool we have. So how do we get more productive with them so that we can ensure that their competencies don't have just the finite time in one experience. If I'm going to hire you for the role today, which we all know this, we want to be thinking about where you're going tomorrow. So we're reinvesting in our talent. We're reinvesting in our technology stack right now. So Smart Recruiter is at the forefront of that. We're putting in another top layer to, to connect with Smart Recruiter in terms of how we're going to manage our, our, our candidates. But I think the, the, the fundamental part that we're working on now is once you've joined us, how do we ensure that we're personalizing your, your learning and personalizing your training so that way as you continue your evolution with us, we can start to say, you know what, here's Sarah's strengths and here's learning opportunities she has versus Alexis's learning opportunities and his strengths, even though they're in the same exact role, they're pacing at the same exact clip, how do we ensure we're continuing and give them the right stuff so that they can control their, their career? And um, you know, in New Zealand, it's interesting, a lot of New Zealanders, as they become of age, they're looking at, oh my God, I want to get to London, I want to get to New York. San Francisco sounds amazing. So we're losing a lot of the great talent that's being grown within the country. Um, and then after about six or seven years, they come back with, with a wealth of experience. And then there's tons of people from Asia that are coming in that say, hey, we want to set up a career and a life here in New Zealand. So I think we have an obligation to figure out how we manage that talent, how we manage that opportunity and connect them to the learning experiences they need, but then also how they can contribute to a great customer experience. And that's kind of like what we're looking at right now about how does that all kind of come together. Amazing. It's interesting because I remember if it was not that many years ago when you would hear all the time, your career is owned by you and it's entirely up to you and how you drive your career is up to you and the only person that limits you is you. And now that has really flipped around and oh. we're in much more of a position where we're like, oh my God, we have to help you with figuring out your career. You know, I think people are less loyal to companies today, right? Mm -hmm. So now I think, uh, you know, the gig economy, everyone keeps talking about. And I, 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 I truly believe that that's here already. So how do we create an, uh, an open market that allows us to get the best of you while you're with us and we give you enough experiences that when you're done, you can walk away and say, hey, this is awesome. I'll just maybe make this last point. You know, one of the things I love about the warehouse group too is uh, like here in the US, if I were to drop out of high school, I'd have to get a GED. Well, the warehouse actually has programs where if you complete training on the job, you actually get education credits and you can get certified to levels. So I think that's pretty amazing that New Zealand allows that and we're one of those companies that actually provides those experiences. It's very cool.
So. Very exciting. I'm probably going to rip you guys off and put you in a position where you're not going to have time for Q&A, so sorry in advance. But I have two more questions, and they're the best ones, and I don't want to skip them. Um, so you'll just have to find these guys at the party later, and they'll be able to answer all of your questions, I promise. They're an open book. Um, OK, so second to last question, and this is for all of you, so in no particular order. If you could give this audience one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, don't wait. <laughs> <laughs> we waited uh, a, little bit a little bit longer than we ideally wanted to for change and certainly have made leaps and bounds catching up, but um, yeah, don't wait. Ask a lot of questions. Um, push boundaries. Um, don't be afraid of change. Yeah. Fair. I mean, I think my piece of advice is just around talent in general and moving to betting on people in the organization first. I think we, we've got a new project or we've got, a, a, you know, a, we've got to replace a role and we're very quick to, okay, how do we fill it um, versus looking internally um, and stretching somebody. It, it is like more often than not, that's going to work out in terms of developing that person and the bottom line to the organization because you didn't have to search for however many days to, to get that talent. And then they're the culture fit. They're already there. Um, I think we should all just bet more on the people internally that we have. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, I, I would say, kind of like what Jerome said this morning, empathize. Empathize with the population that, you, that you're working with um, and figure out ways that you can create a consumer experience for them. Um, and I, I agree, I think a lot of the talent that we already have just hasn't had the opportunity to kind of blossom. So it's remove the restrictive pieces that are there and go for the emerging uh, talent, go for the emerging uh, players in the market. You know, no one gets fired for putting SAP or Oracle in place, but um, sorry to actually name drop those two, but the reality is there's a ton of other great companies that are out there and there's tons of ideas. So you just have to look out there and be open to something that you may not have originally thought about. Very good. And we didn't pay him to say that either, just to be clear. Um, okay, so my last question. I asked this question, if you've seen me on a panel before, you know I ask this every time, and I love it because I've never had the same answer twice. Um, so favorite question of all time. So predictions for the future. Where do we see retail going, TA going? What do you see in the next year or two, or go outlook as far as you want, but in the future? What's coming in the future? Yeah, I would say for uh, one of the things that we quickly realized through this process is that we have to think globally, um, especially because our, our uh, recruiting customer is our customer and vice versa. And if, if we're um, not really thinking about that experience, like that's, that's a huge you know, miss for us. So we, we certainly made, made um, leaps there, but I, you have to think globally um, and you truly have to continue to innovate and change. Like that innovation and change doesn't stop. Um, so if you're not reassessing the process, you, you truly have to on, a, on an ongoing basis. So um, think globally, you know, take a customer-centric mindset to, to all of your approaches. That's the first time I've ever heard anybody slip and instead of saying candidate, he actually called them recruiting customers. Just you heard it here first. I love it. <laughs> uh, my prediction is that the Toronto Maple Leafs will go to the Stanley Cup final. <laughs> no way. Sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, I'd, I've, I've been seeing this a lot lately. I have um, two stepchildren, 24 and 29, so they're like full millennials. Um, <laughs> and they don't even have laptops. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, we're, there's a whole bunch of generations that have gone through digital first. Um, and I think, you know, we were quick to try to like digital this, digital that. So my prediction is actually that in the talent space, we're going to really find it difficult in all of the customer-facing um, air industry. So whether it be retail or sales, I think there's going to be a real pull on talent for people who can empathize, who, people who can relate, people who can lead. I mean, I think those are going to be the skills of the future that are going to be really tough to find um, because we're just not we're just not doing that anymore as much as we used to. So I think the jobs in retail, jobs in hospitality, jobs in sales for sure are going to be really tough jobs to fill in the near future. Yeah, so I, I couldn't agree more with uh, what panelists have said. You know, I think what we're also going to see too is um, more collaboration within companies for talent. So, you know, I think as we get pressed for opportunities, uh, we get pressed for operating profits and all those other things that are wrapped around that, you'll probably see more and more uh, companies collaborating for the talent and being able to share them. You're already seeing it with uh, businesses collaborating in terms of offering two different concepts within one roofline 
why aren't we doing that with talent yet? Um, so I could, I could see a lot more of that happening in the near future, depending on the organization's appetite for change. Amazing. They're literally going to start playing the Oscar music because it's been over for a while and the thing is blinking. So thank you very much, you guys, for this. It was amazing. I'm sure that there are many questions in the audience. I'm not going to make you stand up in the mic because we've run out of time. Um, but team will be around at the party. Please ask them questions. Um, and thank you guys so much for coming. This was great. Yeah, thank you.